Basically, what I'm going to do today is just an hour session. I'm just going to be honest and talk about my three films. Um, I'm here as part of the success story. That was how it was built. Um, and I must say, my relationship with Paul Bello has gone back quite a few years now, when The Plague originally showed at 2004 at the festival, um, and it picked up Best Director Awards. Also, my, the collective I was involved in in 2005 had a night at Paul Bello in 2005. Uh, I did some no-budget workshops, I think, in 2007. So for a long time I've been involved in Portobello, and I mean, it's an incredible festival, mainly because it supports no-budget filmmakers. It supports people actually out there doing stuff on the streets, which is really relevant. Um, so when they asked me to come do this, I was like, of course, like, without a doubt, itching to come here. And then when I read Success Story, I was like, oh, OK, um, how do I fit into that? Because obviously there's, you know, I'm not going to lie, I've got like cuttings, newspaper cuttings back at home, gathering dust. So there, there, there's success there, I can prove that, but part of me is like I'm still here, I'm still making films. Um, I wouldn't say I've had a, I've made it moment, I've not made a lot of money, I've not made, my company's called Broke But Making Films, which is the most honest thing, it's not just a brand name, that is basically me, I am broke, I'm skin, my first film was made on three and a half grand, I just finished my new feature on ten grand. Um, so I'm lucky that I, you know, people write about me, people, some people have held me up on a pedestal, which is very great. Um, but I suppose the honest thing is, and hopefully at the end of the, the talk I can maybe pin down what is success. Um, is success, you know, getting the big budget film, is it working in advertising, or is success maintaining, just keeping projects out there and making relevant cinematic culture? Um, I think you'll probably be able to gather which one I agree with. Um, but just to start off, like, I, I first started making films. Um, my earliest memory as a kid was uh, playing with my mum. Um, I'd just seen Duel by Steven Spielberg on TV, which was the most incredible film. This is like the earliest memory I ever have. And I, I acted out a story to my mum and got her to write it down. Um, and that, I would say, was my first inclination of filmmaking. And as I've grown up, filmmakers have influenced me. I would say Peter Watkins. If anyone's ever seen any Peter Watkins films, the guy is the greatest British filmmaker ever. Ken Loach and Mike Lee, he completely owns them. Like every British filmmaker, this guy is incredible. And the point is, people might sit there and go, Peter Watkins, who is that? A lot of people might hear, hear might think that. And that's exactly the point. You can walk into any HMV, pick up a Guy Ritchie film, which is, you know, pandering to an American audience. But actually, one of our greatest filmmakers, Peter Watkins from the 60s, you cannot get any of his films on DVD. Or if you can, they're really hard. And that is a, to me, that's like offensive. Because it's like, you know, in Britain, it's, we got so much culture going on in Britain. And the industry is just set up for the business side of things. And not actually supporting or letting this, this culture come through. Um, so I would say Peter Watkins, the main man. I love people like Frederick Wiseman, the documentary filmmaker. Um, but I also love people like Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese. I'm not going to get all kind of avant-garde and start, you know, quoting Goddard and things like that. That's not really what I'm into. I think films should be entertaining. I think they should have a message. Um, so basically, when I first started making films, it was with an old VHS uh, unit. Um, my dad had bought us a family present, an old Video 8 camera. Um, and from that, I used to basically plug the Video 8 camera into a VHS machine and press play on that and pause and record on the VCR. Now this taught me a great discipline because anyone that uses a v VCR <coughs> machine, if people still use them, will know that when you put it on pause, after about five minutes, it stops. So basically, if I was cutting a film, every cut, if, it, if I left it five minutes and it came off pause record, I couldn't do the cut, it would leave in a glitch. So this would mean I would have to cut every single film in one sitting. So if I needed the toilet or make a cup of tea, I'd have to make the cut, pause and record it, run to the toilet, get back, get the next cut lined up and keep going. So it was from that discipline, this was before like, the age of um, computers and digital really kicked in. So this was a very basic DIY approach using domestic equipment. So I was probably about 14, 15 when I first started off doing that. And I think that kind of uh, discipline taught me well when, when then going into um, digital filmmaking. 
Also, just to say that um, I was part of a collective as well called Collective Vision, which I mentioned just briefly earlier. And that was off the back of film school. So there was like 10 of us as filmmakers really supporting each other. We used to put on um, events every two months called Free Cinema, where every short film brought along got showed. Similar kind of ethos to Portobello, really. Just trying to bring people together and support grassroots culture. Okay, look, before I get on to talking about my main films and really kind of getting into it, I'm going to be showing a couple of clips as we go. So the first clip, if Ben, if you're there, yeah. um, I want to show the trailer to my first feature film, The Plague. I'll talk about it afterwards. Let's just show the trailer and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it on. So enjoy this. It's only a minute and a half, very short. Some old school sound, man. Are you just dropping that? Like, no one listening <laughs> to the tune. And out of nowhere, you come just on, come on, we can play this later, man. 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 Just kick a freestyle, I'll do the beat, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Setting up shit for the party. You get me, but I want to show you like this rhyme, yeah? I want to show you like this rhyme, yeah? Smooth on. I'm trying to show something for you like this. Air what? It's like a maze. 3D made from purple haze. Blurred vision, excel to the peak is my mission. Closed doors, I'm trying to open. Better days hoping. No choice, you said the hustle. We roping, stay we talking. So many different ways to eat. So many different ways to fall off your feet. So I try to keep my mind right. Same time, keep the grind tight. Straight shot. I sat dark and cold nights, great even with fat Try hard not to ignite the hype Low key, low in the tree, collect the G's Fast and slow for the pips They got me out of road, though, dying Chick got me ready to send my birth flying Tears stay crying, they saying that The niggas that stay lying They stay lying, but I stay high and Twisting buds with my buds what are you doing, man? Round about now, it's the weekend, bro. You two again, you two again. Go on. Yeah, go on then. Okay, um, as I talk as well, I just want to say to kick off, um, I'm just going to talk about my experiences. I don't think there's any set pattern or exact way to get into the film industry or this or that. So, you know, I'm just going to give honest opinions of what I've done, anecdotes, what worked, what didn't, and whatever you take away from that. I'm not saying I'm here and this is the way everyone should do it, yeah? So I just want to kind of make that clear from the offset. Um, the Plague, uh, shot that for three and a half thousand pounds, um, over 60 actors, it was shot in three weeks. Um, majority of the actors were untrained, uh, kind of real, yeah, brought real authenticity and edge to it. Um, the idea and original funding, so basically I finished art school at 2003, had set up a collective, but by the end of art school I'd spent three years doing a film production course but by the end felt quite disillusioned that the end thing was, you know, going into the industry, going into advertising. I, I'd sat in art school, you know, getting deeply involved in anti-war politics, reading like situationist texts, yeah, as you do in art school, you know. Um, and I thought there, there must be more to this. You know, film to me was like a culture. It was like, you know, all culture is organic. It comes from people. We reflect the world we see around us from like when cavemen used to paint in, in their caves. They, they were showing the world around them. So to me, it was like, uh, I just want to express and at least tell a story that connects with people, as opposed to just being a lackey, working in the media, working for TV. It was things I, I really wasn't into. Now, the original idea for The Plague was loosely based on stories of me and my friends when growing up, um, from about the age of 15, just little anecdotes here and there. And I was always thinking, you know, where, where was our culture? You know, MTV didn't reflect it. it. It was just giving us the kind of blinged urban culture. And that, that didn't really relate to us. Um, and what I wanted to show was a real authenticity of how day-to-day -day life and pull these little stories that had been going on for the past few years. And it was when my producer, who's also my sister, Becky, was working at South Thames College, 
um, with some of these young guys that she invited me in. And then I was like, oh shit, this is some of these guys, they're, they're perfect. Like the roles just fitted perfectly. Um, so myself, Becky, that was basically the team to start with. I just wrote a script in about a month, uh, leaving art school, so about the end of June, July, and just said, let's do it. Now coming out, I was on the dole, I was able to get as a kind of graduate a little bank loan, and basically that money, um, a bank loan and a credit card, funded the film. They always tell you, in all these books you can buy, which I'm not really into, these, there's a, it's a whole other industry itself, on buying di you know, books on how to make films, like digital filmmaking, my ethos is get out and do it. Um, and that was really, and they do tell you don't use credit cards, don't do that, and I understand, you shouldn't, but I was just itching, if I didn't make a film, then what was, the, what was the point of being a filmmaker in my eyes? So the funding was absolutely nothing. It started pretty much me and my sister and a handful of um, young guys that we knew. Then we started doing casting, using things like PCR, just filling in more of the peripheral roles. And then we started rehearsing for about four weeks with the young guys. I mean, there's lots of elements of improvisation. There was a script where, as the film gives you a bit of a teaser for, a lot of it was very raw, um, performance-wise, so, and the language as well. Every time we approached a scene, we'd look at the script, we'd know the core of what we wanted to get from the scene, but I was very open to letting people explore. And these young guys brought an authenticity to it that I couldn't bring. Um, and that was the major thing as a writer and director, handing it over to the actors, and also to the crew you work with. My approach is, I believe, in doing things collectively. You can't make a film on your own. I do think you have a role as a director to, to lead and show a vision, but ultimately you're working with people and with your team, and that's the most important thing. And only the team on it was about six people, I think, um, over 60 actors. The core actors were about five or six, um, and we shot for three weeks every single day. For some weird reason, we decided not to have one day off. Um, I don't know why, don't ask me why, it was absolutely mental because it involved night shoots and everything. Um, but, you know, a lot of us were working, so we were taking time off, so we just really had to squeeze it in. It was one of the most gruelling, taxing shoots I've ever done. We had no licences, we were shooting completely illegally. Um, I think the only thing we really paid for was like a van and one location we paid 800 pounds for. So our budget was three and a half grand, one location was 800 quid, um, which um, I think on most films wouldn't even come near their catering budget or anything like that. Um, so this was like literally on pennies. And like I say, it was stressful, it was grueling. I think I must smoke about 60 cigarettes a day and drunk a lot of coffee, but you know, that is part of being on set. That is the beauty, drinking and smoking cigarettes. Uh, if anyone's been on set, you know the kind of uh, atmosphere um, of working together in such a stressful situation where it can bring out of you. Um, but it was a great shoot. It predominantly went successful. Then the edit. Um, I was basically living in a house at the time in Walthamstow where most of it was shot as well. Uh, the house had three bedrooms, but at the time there was about six people living in it. Um, I was in a tiny shoe box which was linked to people's bedrooms and my editor was homeless. He was meant to go back to Ireland and I said, oh no, stay, can't let's cut, and mainly he had a computer, so I was quite uh, Machiavellian. I was like, no, no, stay, let's do this together. So he moved in with, I think he brought a computer, a swivel chair and a water filter. That was it, the guy was homeless, just turned up. And I was in this box room where my bed fitted and literally we had to put his computer at the end and he had to sleep in the door. Now this went on for seven to eight months. Um, as you can imagine, it was pretty intense. Um, luckily, Paco Sweetman, the cut them, uh, cut my film. Uh, we were really great friends and we were both working at a dubbing studio during the day and doing night shifts. Now this dubbing studio, it was kind of, again, the opposite of what we were doing when we were cutting in my flat. Um, we were, you know, we were basically glorified photocopiers. Uh, working in a beta room and VHS rooms, doing jobs for MTV, just basically doing like 100 tapes at a time. Really felt like this cog in this corporate media system. But the beauty was we had access to their online equipment, um, access to lots of things. Let, let's just leave it at that, basically. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. And 
and it was like having one foot in each, you know, I was having to work and pay the bills by working this corporate kind of job, and then just trying to get this film finished in my bedroom. On an old PC, uh, cutting on like uh, illegally downloaded software, um, Premiere, you know, we was, we, we had three and a half grand, I mean, the software is about 900 pounds, so there's no way that was getting paid for. Um, so finally we cut it, it was uh, a really grueling and learning experience when you've made shorts, actually making a feature, learning to tell a story in kind of an hour 45 to two hours, well anything between 75 minutes to two hours, working within that time frame is like mind blowing. And especially, I mean, a lot of filmmakers that are just kind of itching, they keep making shorts and they want to make features. Uh, I come from a different school of thought. I'm, I don't think I've ever perfected a short film, if I'm bluntly honest with you. But that's because I threw myself into features. And now I can't look back because I'm working within a certain time frame and telling a story within that context. Um, that, you know, you become used to it. And that's how you, that's how you get to make features. I think mean, you just got to go out and do it. So basically we finished it, um, this was about May 2004, we were lucky enough we had, first we had cast and crew screening, then we had an industry screening, we were able, we invited everyone from the industry, we were really naive at that time thinking that if you put a film on, journalists, magazines, industry people would want to come support, you know, someone that's made a feature film for three and a half grand. The industry screening was pretty empty. None of these people really turn up, and I find that now. I'm three features in, I've got like awards under my belt, but you know, it's still, still a struggle. And I, you know, a lot of these people are busy, don't get me wrong. I understand how the industry works. It's, you know, they're busy enough just getting one film made that how people can think that the industry can support upcoming culture. There's massive, massive issues, which uh, I'll maybe come back to in a bit. But one of the people we were able to get there was Mike Lee. Um, mainly because his son had worked on the film, and it was mainly like an angle, like, we'd get Mike Lee in, so all these industry people would go, oh, fucking hell, Mike Lee's here. This must be good. Little did we know when the only people there would be Mike Lee and no one else, so it was a bit embarrassing, but... <laughs> Oddly enough, um, I, mean, I mean, a lot of people, a couple of years afterwards, I think The Telegraph came out with an article about the fact his son had worked on it, and this is this nepotism and all that. Anyone that's met Mike Lee, yeah, the guy... Sticks to his guns, and if he doesn't like saying it, he'll tell you to your face, and I know that for sure. He'll tell you to his face what he doesn't like. I mean, he's a filmmaker, he's like me, he's like all other filmmakers. We, we all think we know our way's the right way. That's why we're directors, we like to tell everyone what to do. Um, but that's just the way it is. Um, but he came out of it and he said, look, can I show it to some other people? And he basically showed it to the Catherine Cartledge Foundation. Catherine was an actress in Naked, um, she was in some of his films, Topsy Turvy. She'd passed away suddenly, and they'd set up a foundation. Mike, um, people like Peter Gavissier, her par old partner. Um, big names, Lars von Trier, um, the director of Dogville, is one of the patrons on it. Massive, massive people. So Mike, because of the fact his son was related to it, he wanted to show it to one or two other patrons, just to have a look at it. Still, I didn't know what was going on. And then they turned around and basically said, you know, we're doing this award, the foundation is happening in Sarajevo. And they honestly, they, a lot of them turned around and said, Catherine would have loved this. This is like just in keeping with what she was about, which was about art, being artistic, getting out and doing it, being outspoken. So this was a massive thing when Mike Lee gave us the awards. We were all flown out to Sarajevo, myself, um, Becca, my producer, Leo, the cinematographer, um, Paul, the sound and music guy, and Paco, the editor. Sarajevo was bizarre. It was like a red carpet kind of affair. Incredible, incredible thing as, you know, one minute I'm in my bedroom on the dole, next minute I'm in Sarajevo walking down a red carpet. Um, absolutely surreal. And quite emotionally, it was a lot to take on because all these people were there. It was the first time the foundation had been launched. So all these people were talking about someone they'd lost very close to them. It, you know, emotionally affected a lot of people. And here I was, meant to be getting this award, and I was just like feeling everyone's grief. Um, and so it was a very, it was a bizarre emotional experience. So getting that, getting that platform for Sarajevo, that was massive. But at the same time, the film also showed at Portobello at its first um, public screening in London. 
And luckily, I mean, hip hop was a driving influence when I made this. When I was at art school, we used to listen to a lot of UK hip hop stuff, um, Jest, Brain Tax, Low Life Records, and that whole culture was like based on vinyl. It was before the MP3 downloads, and the whole culture was DIY. It's just like the punk movement, you know, people putting out their own records and supporting, you know, people turning up to gigs, buying the, C the CD out of the artist's hand directly. So that culture influenced the plague, and one of the main guys we got in it was Skinny Man, a guy I've been listening to for years. Loved his uh, music, and I just bumped into him, asked him if he'd do a track for the end, um, and then he turned around and he just went, look, you know, do a video for me, and then I was like, oh, look, we could film you and put you in it. So he did this whole, to break up the narrative, Skinny Man, this quite big UK hip hop artist, is a... Um, Pirate Radio, which really breaks up. If anyone's seen something like The Warriors or Do the Right Thing, in a similar vein. Little did I know at the time, Skinny Man, after 15 years, was getting his first album together, which sold like 50,000 units on an independent record around the same time we were hitting Sarajevo. So that gave like the underground explosion, um, all the hip hop kids. They were also really supportive. So I almost had this like two headed thing with like Mike Lee giving it all credibility to all the Guardian reading um, cinema lovers and then Skinny Man giving it to all the street kids, all the hip hop and grime heads. Um, so I, and things like Kung Fu, a big hip hop night, we were down there promoting. I remember I, when it was at the London Film Festival I'd spent like, I had 30 posters especially for this hip hop night, biggest hip hop night in the whole of London. Cost me like a bomb. Absolute bomb, that's seen on a credit card. And I remember at the end of the night, every single one of them got nicked except one. And part of me was like, shit, that's all my posters. The other part was like, it's a really good sign. And then at the end, Skinny Man walked past me and he went, can I have that poster? And I was like, I can't really say no. Um, so it was like, you know, I was still broke, but it was the fact that people were kind of digging it and were there supporting it was like the main thing, really. Um, and then we did do things like the London Film Festival. That was a massive platform. And it was a slow burner in some respects. Um, and I know JB said it was on BBC Two. But in reality, the film was finished in May 2004. And we're still doing festivals over 2005. Showed in Europe, Austria, Germany, France, Croatia. Um, it showed in New York in 2006. It wasn't until actually 2006 it got picked up by an independent distributor and got a small-scale cinematic release and also got a DVD release in February 2007. So you're talking like two, three years after it was made. So it was this constant trying to push it. And over that time, you know, I had great reviews from all these festivals. Variety had described it as like a Cinderella story. I think I've been compared to everyone from Shane Meadows to Spike Lee to... I can't even remember... I was just frustrated because it was like, you know, I just, want, I just wanted to be me, really. Um, but again, it was the curse and the price. These people are writing about you, but then feeling that you're being pigeonholed or it's only going one way. Um, but, you know, the distributor in the end went bust, as with most things with the credit crunch. Um, I think Gold's, the DVD distributor, went into liquidation. So that is now unavailable. I think there's a few copies flowing around on Amazon. Um, but to say in 2005 as well, we kind of, a company jumped on board around the time of the London Film Festival and tried pushing the digital download concept. I think at the time that kind of peaked a bit early, um, but it was an interesting road. But to be honest, I tried all these things. There was no set pattern. And it's amazing in the film industry. You meet so many people with like uh, get-rich-quick ideas and you can kind of get sucked into some of them. But, you know, you've got to try your hand, and that was my attitude. A any avenue, I'll try it, constantly keep pushing it, networking, speaking to people, and promoting it. Flyers on a street level, constantly keeping that going. Um, one of the, the problems with the digital download a couple of years later was that the Odeon wouldn't show it. Um, no, all Odeons refused um, because it had been available. Only 200 people have downloaded it. I found that pretty um, stupid, but that was their policy. So I think that is saying with the explosion of the internet, filmmakers really need to be aware of what, you know, when to release it, I think, on the net, because festivals won't, will turn it down, distributors will. Um, but I'll get onto more of this in a point, in a sec, I'm getting ahead of myself, but just to recap on doing the plague, 
I mean, it came about at a time, it was before films like Bullet Boy, um, which we went head to head with at the London Fest, Film Fest from 2004. And jokingly, I actually met some of the producers of the Film Council about six months afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of like, oh, we're really sorry we went head to head. And I was like, it's fine, you know, I don't mind the old David and Goliath. I'm happy to be delayed. David, if you're happy to be Goliath, um, knowing who won out of that battle. So I kind of was always cheeky with these things, and even things like Kid Old Hood, their DVD used the same tagline as us, uh, Welcome to the 21st Century, and my Skinny Man music video was on Kid Old Hood. So I would like to think in a, in a small way that The Plague was one of the first films that came out before the whole explosion of what is called British Urban, which to me is something I really wanted to move away from once I got pigeonholed with The Plague. I'd, straight, I'd say like, the plague is, me is from street culture. It's not about street culture. There's a major difference. I mean, a lot of corporates want to make things about street culture. That's why Foxtons use like graffiti fonts. Um, that's why Sprite will be using the, the latest street artist. There's a major difference. Whereas this, the plague, came from us with no money. It came from the support of the hip hop community. It came from the support of the, the young lads and the young girls we were working with. And it was the, the team, the, co the collective nature of how we made it. And to me, that's street culture. And we pushed it ourselves. And even when we did get the big awards and all the fancy things, it's still about being out there and doing it yourself and meeting people and, and talking and showing stuff and organizing your own screenings and just networking and meeting younger filmmakers and people doing stuff. This will move me on to my second feature, which I will now show the trailer for. So. I won't say any more, but I'm going to show you Capital. It is the complete antithesis of the plague. It couldn't be any more different. And the volume's quite loud on this one, but <coughs> uh, we can just run the Capital trailer and I'll talk a bit more about that. Jerusalem! The faithful city is now become a harlot. So that was Capital. Um, now this was made, uh, came out in 2007. Uh, this will kind of overlap with Plague stuff basically, um, because before the Plague was released after I shot this, so I was down in Manchester, so it all kind of came hand in hand in some respects. Capital started out, um, Catherine Cartledge, the actress that passed away, randomly I got a phone call out of the blue from a guy called Steve Martland, a, a composer. And he said I was best friends with Catherine, Nothing to do with the foundation. I've read about this award you got. Um, he li I lived in Finsbury Park. He lived on Blackstock Road. Anyone knows North London? They're right next to each other. Um, he said, meet me for a coffee. I went and met him. Lovely guy. Anyone's ever met a classical composer? Wow. I thought I was pretty pedantic. Steve would sit there with scrolls of music, like writing things. I was like, this guy is mental. I've got to work. This is incredible. Uh, we had a really lovely dynamic. Um, he was such a passionate guy, does lots of music with um, children. Within the classical world, really respected as like a contemporary classical, you know, within the classical movement, he's the troublemaker. Um, so I think we, we, you know, our spirit's really connected with that one. Um, so we met, I showed him the plague, and I, I think he phoned me going, oh, I feel really bourgeois after watching that, which was... Uh, with Steve's politics, that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, 
And basically, he was like, we've got to do something together. We tried getting a project off the ground. Um, we met Alex Poots, the head of the English National Opera. And we tried to get something with um, Channel 4, the Three Minute Wonders. Steve wanted to do Cuban music. It was going to be with the English National Opera. I was going to direct it. We had this brilliant lineup of things. Now, getting a meeting with Channel 4 is like a nightmare. Um, and the project never went anywhere. Then Alex moved jobs from the English National Opera. He was headhunted to um, be the director of the Manchester International Festival. Now, it, this was a brand new festival set up in 2007. And the idea was it was meant to be bian biannual every two years. And it was a commissioning festival, the first festival in the world that actually commissions artists to make stuff. It was music driven. I mean, the biggest thing to come out of the 2000 festival was Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewitt from the Gorillas did an opera. Um, so they did the music and all the costume design. There was a director, so that was a big opera that went from Manchester and toured around the world. Um, there were smaller projects. Johnny Vegas did something um, where he, you were taken to a house and he gave you a tour of it. It was written by Stuart Lee, very in character. So really mad kind of concepts. And there was about 11 commissions. And, I, and Alex turned around and went, oh, I want to commission you and Steve as a film to music project. It was completely open-ended. He said, Steve, write the music, Greg, do a film. And it was the only film um, commission at the entire, pro uh, the entire festival in 2007. Now, the concept, as I say, was completely open-ended. And Alex said to me he wanted me to push myself as an artist and really work differently. Um, I interpreted that as basically moving away from the plague. And I think as a young filmmaker, like I say, I was still... The plague had done all these wonderful things, but Universal hadn't picked it up. You know, no, no one was... Uh, you weren't seeing me getting paid thousands of thousands of pounds for doing this or that. I was still struggling, um, doing teaching work, this odd, odds ends um, here and there. Um, so to me, it was like I wanted to get away from the plague. I didn't want to do anything urban. I didn't want to do anything street um, that could be pigeonholed as street. Um, I was still coming with the same mentality that, of viewing the world from the bottom up. Um, and basically, there was no limitation. I contractually got final cut. Oddly enough, when Alex brought in the other producers, they, they couldn't believe he had agreed to all the things he agreed to with me. Um, you know, what he'd let me get away with. Basically, in my contract, n none of the commissioners were even allowed on the set, anything like that. No, this can be unheard of. Um, and in retrospect, I think, the, you know, it, it might have been good having one or two producers keeping me in line. But, you know, it was... I was 25 when I made Capital. Um, I took four fairy tales. Uh, one was like a Jewish fairy tale, one was an uh, Aboriginal fairy tale, I think a Nordic fairy tale and a Hispanic one. And just stripped them down to their basis. It was like literally it was about six pages of just the four fairy tales. Um, myself, um, Becky, again my producer, who I've I worked so closely with my sister over the years, and I should say my sister's an uh, actress, um, and when I left film school, one of the things they don't teach you at film school is working with actors. And I've learnt that um, through working with my sister, through working with all her friends, everyone she's hooked me up with, and doing work with my sister, doing theatre and education stuff. So when, when I went up to Manchester, it was basically me and Becky, the whole team. So I involved Becky as being a co-director, because I knew I wanted to bring a, a very different approach. So me and her kind of devised a three-month period before the filming. Um, and I'll come back to this. Let me just say how we uh, cast this, because we had to cast from Manchester. That was one of the limitations. So it was completely unknown cast. We were, no, you know, we had completely open. But instead of getting people to come down and do a monologue or anything like that, we just told them to come down 15 minutes before. They'd have a 15 minute slot with us, and that's all they knew. And they, you know, if we were speaking to agents or actors, they're going, "Yeah, but what, what are we reading for? What?" They can't come on unprepared. This was like a lot of them were going, no, no, this is crazy. Basically, they came along outside the um, audition. There'd be a sheet of paper just saying, we want you to come in and tell us a story. So think about a story. They're going to be saying, uh, saying it's happened to you, saying it's happened to a friend. Just tell us a story. You don't want you to act. That's it. So they're sat there probably looking at the other side going, am I not meant to read some lines or anything like that? We'd bring the actor in, just me and Becky sat there. I, I'd be bad cop, she'd be good cop. We'd kind of got it um, down to a T by then. 
And we'd sit them down and honestly just say, tell us this story. Um, I mean, I've heard, over the course of this three weeks, I had some of the most bizarre, craziest stories that people should not be sharing. Um, I heard some genius stuff. I also heard some like, oh my days. Uh, but, you know, it was fun, if nothing else. So they'd tell a story. And, and then me and Beck would sit there and look at our notes. And basically, we'd have a sheet of paper with different emotions. We knew what characters we were casting them for. So then we'd say, well, retell that story, but this time tell it as someone suffering from depression. And they can, you know, don't, you don't have to say it word for word. You can reinterpret it. You can tell one part of the story. You can change it. You can elaborate it. You, it's, there's no right or wrong. And this really showed to us what actors can play. The concept, to me, the best actor, again, I don't come from the, a drama background. Uh, I don't know my Stanislavski from my, from my elbow, really. But um, to me, children, when you see kids play, that's the best actors. They're just in their worlds. They, they can see it. They can smell it. They can breathe it. It's, a, it's amazing. So to us, we just wanted to get out these qualities from these actors to really see whether they could improvise. And not just improvise and throwing a few funny lines here or there, as I see in a lot of films, their improvisation. It, it isn't really based in character, but more based in throwaway stuff. Um, and we, we could really see how their minds would work as actors. So we finally whittled them down to ten through this unique process we'd organised. And none of them knew the stories. None of them knew what they were involved in. A majority of them never met. Then over three months, we, we devised this unique, I wouldn't say it's a devising period, not even a rehearsal period. I'll give you one of the stories in Capital. It's about a father and a daughter. They're, the wife has recently passed away. It was based on an old Nordic tale. And it's about the father abusing his daughter, seeing her almost as the, the wife who had passed away. Now over the course of the three months, when we first met these two actors playing the dad and the daughter... We sketched, we told them one or two little bits of information about their relationship, about the mum dying. And we had all these photos of this woman going, this is your mum, this is your wife. They gave her names. They took away each photo and told stories. You know, the dad was like, this was when we were in Spain. Um, and over three months, we basically did scenes of them having dinner, t dinner together, just the daughter and the, the, the dad, and her doing a kind of GCSEs. But none of it was the, the actual stuff, the story. No, they still didn't know what the story was. And about a month, uh, two weeks before the actual filming, we, we did a unique um, day with them. First we had the dad in, and we did a scene with... We actually, we had the dad and the daughter, and they had a big argument. It was after parents' night. So we did this scene when they had a big argument, and she went to her bedroom to go to sleep. We then sent her off for lunch. And then we said with the dad, he falls asleep in the chair. And we, we ran a scene with him, and he said, look, we're going to run this scene, and in the middle of this, someone's, something's going to come into it, and you've just got to react to it. So we ran the scene with him, he passes out, and then suddenly we brought in the actress who the photos were of. They didn't even know, this was, you know that we knew this woman. And she came in and sat down, and then she asked, in character, she asked him to wake up. And she started saying things to him which... He had been doing with me and Becky, just writing down as brainstorming, stuff that he would never know that this person would know. And it just blew his mind. And then at the end of the scene, we put him back to sleep. And then she went away, and then we woke him up, said, you're out of character now. And he never met her out of character. He was just like, what the fuck? Just, what did you just do to me? <laughs> then we did the same thing with the actress playing the daughter. We then sent that actor away, brought the daughter in, and we continued that scene of her in her bedroom. And we said, you know, you're going to sleep, and in the middle, you'll wake up. Something will wake you up. We did the same trick, brought her in. She started singing a song, which the actress had said, this is what my mum used to sing to me. I've never seen someone break down in so many tears when she woke up and saw her, what she thought was her mum. And I actually sat there thinking, fuck, have we gone too far? This is like, this is a bit, I feel really bad. Um, and again, the actress was put to sleep, and the mother left. And again, never saw her out of character until the film premiered. Now, when we actually shot the film, it was four stories. And I should say with their story, she had like an Asian boyfriend. The dad was quite racist. And there was, we were doing scenes with just the boyfriend and the girl about like when the, mom for, when the dad first threw out 
all her mum's things without telling her. So the boyfriend was building up resentment to the dad. The dad knew nothing, even the actor didn't know nothing about the fact that his daughter, or the actress playing his daughter, that this was a storyline. So these two never met until the first time on camera. And when we shot Capital, it was for five week shoot, and we shot it in chronological order. So every story was shot in chronological order and stuff happened on screen for the first time. This was an amazing process for me as a director to kind of go on and was kind of developing where I'd started off with the plague. That had a script but it was improvised. This was a lot looser, um, was devising and had no script really. We were shot, shooting it as we were going. And I should say the cinematographer I used, again, a completely different look to the plague. Um, the shoot was mental. Again, physically, I should say I've had shingles twice. So, like, this is a warning. Like, you know, you can get nice things written about you, but you can also get shingles. So, uh, beware. Um, I think after the five-week shoot, I was in A&E, just sat there. Like, um, what the hell, you know, what the hell am I doing? I'm killing myself, but, you know, I love making films, so what can you do? Um, the edit, again, was with Paco Sweetman. Uh, this time, he wasn't sleeping um, in between two bedrooms. We actually had a, a small edit set up in an office space, and the whole approach, me and Paco have worked on music videos together under the name of the Beta Brothers, um, doing hip-hop underground videos from about 2005 to 2008. So our working relationship was great, and we really experimented with this film. I'd say it was more art house. It premiered at the festival, it was just for the festival, showed five screenings, completely sold out. The Metro loved it, gave it four out of five stars. A lot of people hated it, I'll be absolutely honest with you. Maybe they were expecting the plague. I should also say that the festival was set up by the city council and all the big developers. Um, and to me, it was part of the gentrification. If you go to Manchester, no one from Manchester lives in the city centre. It's all yuppies. And it's like anywhere. It's like anywhere you live. It's gentrification. Push the poor people out. Run the estates down. Don't give a fuck about the crime. Don't give a fuck about the drugs. Over-police it to, to hell. Don't offer any community support. Don't offer a any alternatives. Run an area down, move the people out, knock it down, rebuild it into nice loft apartments, move in the rich people. That, 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 that's what's happening in the whole of Britain. And this was saying really in my face in Manchester. And to me, I was like, well, the festival's part of a cultural gentrification. The point of the festival, put on by the city council and the, the big developers, wasn't really to support Manchester culture or people there. It was to bring rich people from London to come see all this fantastic stuff that people in The Guardian write about and all that kind of stuff. So part of me felt like uh, the fact that I created freedom, I had to, you know, I couldn't sit on my hands. Um, I had to say something about this. And I would say the, the Capital is a very bleak film. Um, it looks at everything, everything from incest to rape to murder to racism. It's all in there. Um, you know, it's not a commercial success. It never will be. Uh, but that wasn't the point of doing it, and that's not why I went into it. I was like, I've got an opportunity to make a film, and not in that context. People that funded it probably really pissed off. They wanted an advert for people to move to Manchester uh, after seeing this. And I got pulled up on BBC Radio. They're going, ah, oh, you come from London making a depressing film about Manchester. People from Manchester worked on it and were involved in it. They've, 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 they made that film. And there's a, throughout the whole film, there's this massive skyscraper. Anyone goes to Manchester, as you approach it, you just see this massive phallic skyscraper. The rest of Manchester's like that. And to me, everywhere I walked, you could see this thing, so that's like a pivotal thing. Um, but I didn't show it in the light that I think the festival wanted it to. So I finished Capital, not as much great success off the back as the play, I admit. Um, a great experience as a filmmaker. And then it's kind of like I went through 18 months of trying to get a script off the ground, I've met all the right people. I've been to Film 4, I've been to Warpex, I've been to UK Film Council. I, could, I got them all marked off on my wall, trust me. Um, but still, getting nowhere. And that brings me to where I am now. And we're going to run the next trailer, SSDD, same shit, different day. This is my new feature I made for 10 grand. Finished it in February. It's going to be shown at the Portobello Film Festival. Let's just run that and I will talk a little bit about that and just try and wrap things up because I am running a bit behind. But let's run that benches. Oh, get out. You fucked up the windows, man. Yeah, just fucking kids in it fucking about. 
Ain't like the real thing, man. Like the good old days. <coughs> oh, yeah? Mm mm mm. Mm mm mm. Fucking hell, man. I was at the Bone Tax, May 1990. Mm. At the riots. Yeah. It's fucking serious. Serious shit. It's like me in a fucking movie. <laughs> about what? <laughs> Take that shit with ya! Fuck are you talking about? Look at your acting Look at your acting. People are worth more than, than other people's crumbs. See, theoretically you've got free speech, as long as you don't practice it. And if you practice it, boom, they come down and you're like a ton of bricks, don't they? <sighs> Two, Two years old, I sat in a fucking cell. Sort of Okay, so in some respects, I kind of come full circle. Uh, I kind of, like, after Capital, if I'm bluntly honest, that's, like, just how I left art school. Pretty depressed. Pretty, like, well, what, the, what am I doing? I'm just skint. I'm just... And, you know, I've been 18 months having meetings with all the right people, hearing all the right things, but just getting frustrated. Being really, really frustrated. Because, personally, I didn't feel that Capital and the Plague showed the best I could do. And I'm getting older now, you know. I made the Plague when I was 22. I made Capital when I was 25. And I was a, I'm a young man, I was getting judged on these things, I know, I know I've got so much more potential. We were lucky, well we started SSDD, um, it's loosely using actors from the plague and capital, from both my previous features, eight actors. Um, we started the ball rolling, again I phoned up Becky, my sister, and we're back, we're making a film. I've got a title, it's called SSDD, same shit, different day. She's like, brilliant, what's it about? Yeah, I don't know that yet, but we're, 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 we're flesh it out as we go. Um, <laughs> the funding, all I can say was, uh, we got 10 grand from, if you've ever heard about a man with a wooden leg that someone goes to see about a dog, that's basically where we got the 10 grand from. Um, no strings attached, no questions asked, but they don't want the 10 grand back. So 10,000 pounds, a budget, actors, a title, a producer, so you got to do it, really. I was like, I was, just, I was having moments of like late at night thinking, oh, just got to get back, back. It felt like, you know, people talking about Vietnam being in the shit. I was like, got to get back in the shit, man. Got to be back in, you know, guerrilla filmmaking. Got to be back out shooting handheld. That's what it's about. I was like, you know, credit crunch cinema, man. It was like, you know, the recession as well. I was like, bring it on. This is what it's about. This is where I can thrive in a recession. You know, I make stuff with no money. There's no money around, so... For me, it's great, you know, I'm, I'm doing better. Um, so basically, it started off, I chatted with one or two of the actors, threw around some ideas. As a young man, I was developing my stories, the kind of people I was mixing with, and moving on from things, uh, themes I explored in Capital and the Plague, and came up with a seven-page outline. Again, you, you'll be getting a, you know, seeing the way I do things. It's not always with like, a fully written script. And from that seven eight page outline, it was just the main scenes, all predominantly set in a pub in Hackney um, called the Moth Club. I knew it was really easy to pull off. I wanted to put in a lot more. The, the good things from the plague was the humour. Capital was a little bit too depressing, so I wanted to kind of balance that issue. We basically rehearsed for three weeks. And what we did was we looked at each scene and got the actors, first I got them into character, they did their character work. We did hot seeing techniques, where we interviewed them in character, did all their backgrounds, all that kind of thing. Then we started them improvising the scenes from the seven page outline. And I filmed those, and then I'd literally, at night, sit and script it. So I scripted, scripted it from the improvisations this time. So I did actually have a script when it came to shooting, which was like one of the major things I felt was lacking on Capital. I loved that process but wanted a script. But they still improvised off that script. But having that blueprint when making things on no money was like a, a lifesaver. And, you know, I knew all the actors. I'd worked with them on both my previous two films. I knew exactly what I could get out of them. Uh, we knew the locations. I knew, I basically based the idea that it was so simple that it could be done on 10 grand. And again, the shoot was fairly difficult, as most shoots are. Well, I think it went quite well. I was ill again. But I didn't get shingles this time, so that's, that's a sign. Um, 
This film we just finished up, it showed in February. Again, the edit was four months, so I actually cut it on my own. And um, I worked with, the guy doing the music is a guy called Jest. Again, things came full circle. So the guy whose vinyl I was listening to that inspired my first film was now doing the soundtrack on this film. Now, Jest comes from like a hip hop background. And that hip hop culture, he works with what is called an MPC machine, where you sample from a vinyl record and you create loops. And that's the core of hip hop. And I said to him, oh, let's get, we got a musician to play stuff. And he then took, he had all that samples, original samples to then work with and create that score. So again, my whole approach was that kind of creative DIY. And I was living with Jester at, at that time. So I was editing in my bedroom and he was doing the music in his, uh, in his bedroom. So, which just goes to show, three features in, I'm still cutting in my bedroom. Um, best place to cut, you know. Um, SSDD is going to be showing at the Portobello Film Festival this September. Um, also, it's got into the London UK Film Focus, which is an event put on by Film London at the end of June, from the 28th to the 1st of July, which is for sales agents and buyers and sellers. So this is going to be the first time I've gone down this route of trying to actually get a sales agent. Um, so I'm kind of running out of time, and I wanted to talk a bit more about the distribution, but I'll just try and cap up and mention a bit about that. And if people want to talk to me, I'll be outside and stuff, yeah, because I've got like five minutes. Um, I mean, the thing with, like, look, this is it, yeah, distribution's the key. That, that's the bottom line. I, put, I, I can go out, I can make films. I know loads of people that can do it. I've seen fucking incredible stuff and incredible people working within Britain, across Britain, not just in London. I feel we can become a bit London-focused, but across the whole of, the, of Britain, there's so much going on, so much grassroots, independent stuff. But it's, it's the distribution, getting that. And I think the way the industry's set up is that people are so busy, getting a foot in there is impossible. Even with awards from Mike Lee, <laughs> you're still not getting it, you know, it's difficult. And I think what, what needs to happen is, something's got to meet halfway. This is all I can say, I don't have any answers here, but something's got to meet halfway. We've got the people doing the independent culture, we've got the, the infrastructure of the film industry there, but for me, the film industry only wants to make Four Weddings and Another Notting Hill, so like really bourgeois bollocks. Urban stuff it wants to make is to me just offensive to kids. Like absolutely offensive and I think actually a lot of it glorifies a lot of the shit it's pretending to be against. Uh, it's, it's just dumb. And kids, and the thing is an audience is intelligent, kids are intelligent and people in Britain are intelligent and we shouldn't be force fed stuff that's pandering to Hollywood. We're, we're perfectly situated between Europe and America. We can sell our films to America, because they're English language, but we should know that Europe's there. Europe supports its own film industry. We don't have that. And, and something needs to happen. Something needs to happen, and I think it will, with the development of the new um, technology that's coming around. But the ultimate, the final thing to come over is distribution. And that's key. There are a few more things I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about my next project, which is a book called Bash the Rich, which is Ian Bone's autobiography. Um, which I'm making. Um, that's going to be um, hopefully shooting next year. So that was hooked up through the Portobello Film Festival as well. So again, bizarre things come full circle. So I'm trying to get that off the ground now, meeting with the film council, stuff like that. But I have no unique answers. Like I say, I'm just trying to do things. I've just been out there doing what I do. And both my films, The Plague and Capital, are being released on a DVD. Um, one disc for five pounds from my company, BrokeButMakingFilms.com. I've got plenty of flyers outside. You can sign up to the website. There's an update thing. It, there's a group on Facebook and all that. So, you know, please support. Please pick up a copy of the two films for five pounds. SSDD, come along, see it at Portobello. I hope. There's, uh, I don't think we've got time for a Q&A, but I just hope. And some of the things I said, like I say, I'm not here to say this is the way to do it, but. Some of those stories, people can take good things from them, bad things from them, but basically, at the end of the day, anything's possible, and people just need to get out and do it. So, there we go. Thank you very much.